Hi, all. Hello. I, we're competing, as you can tell, with a noisy career fair down the hall, but I'm really delighted to introduce our speaker today, Joshua Gans. Um, Joshua holds the Skoll Chair in Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Rotman School of Management in, at the University of Toronto, where he is a professor of, thank you, a professor of strategic management. Um, prior to that, he worked at Microsoft Research in Cambridge and also was a visiting scholar at Harvard. He is also the managing director of an economics consultancy called Core Research. Uh, the minute you, he opens his mouth, you'll know that he grew up in Australia. Um, he earned a bachelor's of, of economics and the university medal from the University of Queensland and later attended Stanford for his PhD in economics. Uh, in 2007, Gans received the inaugural Young Economist Award from the Economic Society of Australia, which is an award given every two years to the best economist working in Australia who's aged under 40 years old. I'm embarrassing him. Um, Joshua's interests are varied. He's developed specialties in technological competition and innovation, economic growth, publishing economics, industrial organization, and regulatory economics. And he's authored or co-authored a long list of books, um, including uh, the Australasian edition of Greg Mankiw's Principles of Economics, Core Economics for Managers, uh, and the two most recent ones I like, Parentonomics, and Information Wants to be Shared, is the most recent one in 2012. Uh, Gans recently received a Sloan Foundation grant, which I found fascinating. We spoke about it when we met. It's a grant that's going to be used to study the contributions and distributions to the knowledge of economics. It, is that what Somebody it is? got gumbled there. This is garbled. Uh, but as he told me, it's, it's about, about the non economic motivations for information exchange and innovation. It's a fascinating topic. Um, it sounds like it will be a long term project and we can all look forward to the results. But now we're going to hear him talk about will the internet destroy the news media? Please join me in welcoming Joshua. Well, thank you very much. It's a delight to be here. I've had a fantastic day so far. I, this uh, project uh, has been ongoing for quite a number of years now uh, between myself, Susan Athey, who is at Stanford now and uh, uh, is also uh, has a role as chief economist at Microsoft, Emilio Carvano, who's at Bocconi University, uh, as well. Um, and this is basically, we were puzzled by the whole developments going on in, with regard to news media and in particular newspapers. And uh, it, the thing that was puzzling was, was there was clear disruption and change going on. That was no mystery. But that if you stepped back and you thought about it, uh, the fundamentals of the industry were kind of healthy. Uh, there were lots of people wanting to read and consume the news, so the demand side was good. Uh, and on the supply side, uh, at least, in, you know, it was much easier to get the news to people uh, than it was ever before. Uh, this should all be the makings of an industry that was going to be going through health rather than through doom and gloom. So what we're going to present is this pa uh, paper in the paper that's been distributed. Uh, I would, you know, the, the, the paper is, a, uh, is actually quite a bit to digest, partly because the issue turns out to be quite complex. I'd like to be able to simplify it. I made an attempt in my recent book to do the popular version of it that simplifies it too much, probably. Uh, but we're here I want to present the academic paper. And, and basically it's going to introduce a new hypothesis as to why the news industry and news media are in trouble as a result of the internet, something that hasn't been talked about. Um, it's a hypothesis only. Hasn't been proven. Uh, it's not sure. I don't know. It's plausible. Uh, I don't know if it's true. So it's a piece of a theory. Uh, so we'll have to see. But let me give some context uh, first. And so this is going to be a combination of context and things that will be of a broad interest, plus, of course, a model that you'd have to expect from me. So in terms of the fundamentals of the news media, one of the issues is, of course, we're still printing newspapers, printing and distributing them to people. And the reason why that's a puzzle is it's so costly to do that relative to the alternatives. Someone did a calculation, um, and it's, you can replicate it 
uh, today that if you took all the costs of the New York Times in terms of printing and then delivering newspapers, physical paper copies to people today, you could throw that all away and give every New York Times subscriber an iPad, and not just a ordinary iPad, a good one with lots of memory and things, <laughs> and a 3G, you know, why a cellular connection, uh, and still have money left over. In fact, you could give them two iPads and still have money left over, and you could do that every year. So a new iPad, a new one every year as well. So it just, there's something, there's a sense in which, you know, that's, it, seen from that perspective, it's kind of a miracle we still have newspaper printed ones at all. Uh, from the New York Times, they always have this slogan, all the news that's fit to print, and it turns out none of it's fit to print, it's, you know, from an economic point of view. So that's one of the stark things. Now, obviously, you know, in, you know, people are moving online for these things, but, you know, that's got to be the way it's going. The sheer economics is just overwhelming. The other side of it is a reputational side. I doctored this cartoon. On the internet, no one knows you're a journalist. And the part, if you go back 10 years and you look at what the newspapers were worried about their future then, the thing they were worried about was that any old person was going to be able to read a newspaper and then take that content and republish it and uh, no one will pay for the news because it's all been just basically stolen. And there was huge wars against the fans who were retyping Dave Barry editorial, uh, you know, columns in, and distributing over alt.fan.daveberry or something like that. Uh, and and that, was the, that was the threat. In other words, all IP. Um, as it has turned out, now while there's been increased competition, I think it's safe to say, apart from some rattling of uh, Rupert Murdoch regarding Google News and things like that of supposedly stealing content, which doesn't seem to be actually happening, uh, this hasn't turned out to be the part, source of, of, of gloom. So what I'm going to do is sort of talk through, through the, the, the facts this is the outline for the talk. I'm going to go through some stylized facts, and they're stylized in the sense that they're graphs. Uh, then I'm going to uh, look at some suggested theories that have been put forward to explain those stylized facts. I'm going to give you the main hypothesis. I'm going to demonstrate to you what the market would look like, and it'll turn out to be focusing on advertising, in an idealized ad market. Then I'm going to give you the realistic ad market, which is harder to model. And I'm going to talk about some advantages and disadvantages different newspapers might have in advertising markets, and then I'll conclude. Let me go into the stylized facts first. This is the chart of doom. This is newspaper ad revenue in the United States plotted from 1960 to 2011. As you can see, it was all increasing, 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 but for a couple of recessions before it around 2000, 2002, it fell off a cliff. The reason the newspapers are in trouble is that graph. That's the, that's the problem. The advertising revenue disappeared. And it disappeared, of course, in real terms. It's even worse. The fall is even stronger. As a share of GDP, it's been, it was declining a little bit, and then, uh, you know, sort of with the advent of television and other, th other mediums, and then, of course, took a huge dive. So it's not just like recessions. It's worse than recessions. And it's not just circulation. This is the, uh, the chart of doom. Here's the circulation numbers. Circulation has dropped, but if you put these things together, this is why this is stylized, and you put newspaper avenue, uh, ad revenue per paper sold, the graph looks the same. In other words, for each paper sold, they're still earning less revenue. Okay? So it's not just that the corpus of subscribers has gone down, it's the, it's the, it's the, uh, it's the amount they're getting for, for the ads. Um, if we go back to the sort of adjusted chart and sort of break this down, is it all uh, Craigslist? 
Is it all uh, advertisements? Well, if we remove, yes, they lost the classified business. If we remove that, this is how it looks. It's actually worse. You get this blasted back to before 1960 in terms of the loss in display ad avenue for advertising, only with a little bit of an uptake last year that actually rose to, to no, no fanfare at all, actually. But it, 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 it rose. Okay, so it's actually been, you know, the, the decline has been uh, really there in the ads that are bedded within the news itself. And that's the stuff that really paid for the news as opposed to paying for the newspaper boy. Okay. Um, and all this includes online revenues. And what are those online revenues? There it is. So you know what the problem is here. The problem is that people have moved from reading newspapers in print to reading them online or digitally. And the ad revenues haven't come with them. The ad revenues haven't come with them. That, that's the fundamental issue facing that. And what's really interesting about that is that tends to get no focus at all. What that should tell you is that there's a problem with the advertising market. Something's funny with advertising. As opposed to if you read there's a Nyman Lab uh, from Harvard Journalism Report, uh, co-authored amongst others by Clay Christensen, long report about all the challenges facing the newspapers. Nothing about advertising. Basically, the report starts out, advertising has gone away. Oh, well. <laughs> and this just seems surprising. And now, then the report goes on, journalism has to change. You've got to become more like the Huffington Post, and, you know, whatever going on after that. But fundamentally, the problem of ad revenue is uh, newspapers, is newspapers are being read. News is being read. In fact, so some estimates it's been growing over the past decade of 8% a year, which is a booming industry in terms of people actually reading and consuming news in textual format as opposed to watching videos. Uh, yet the ad revenue, somehow that hasn't worked. Okay. Now, this has had some people who have paid attention to and formulated hypotheses. So the theories that have been suggested thus far to say, where did the ad revenue go? The best of them is ineffectiveness. Okay, uh, here's a quote from the Washington Post. Newspaper readers are better than web visitors. Online readers are notoriously fickle bunch and apparently getting more so by the day. Web visitors barely stick around, yet they are counted in the broad traffic statistics as if they were the same reader who lingers over his Sunday paper. So basically, you know, we don't know what people are uh, looking at when, they, when we look at circulation numbers or web clicks or anything like that. And so there's a measurement issue and it's worse on the web. Right. And, you know, to set a market. Yes. Uh, my understanding was that particularly in a lot, most local markets in the U.S., subscription revenue is holding up pretty well. Not right. National papers, maybe. And so one might think that this shift, you know, we're getting more money from the subscribers, but from the ad guys. Right. Can you rule that out? No, well, I'll, I'll come to that. I can't rule it out, but it hasn't, uh, uh, to go to long story, it hasn't made up for the loss in ad revenue, the ability to raise some price, especially when there's a reduction in competition and other things like that as newspapers fail. Uh, but it hasn't made up for it. Uh, so even the New York Times, which is finally starting to claw back uh, subscription revenue, still is still not getting the overall revenue that it used to get per reader as I understand it. But the, the, this is part of the thing that's changing. Um, and so I guess I, I'm, and, and to kind of look, I'm going to focus on that advertising puzzle because it is, it, it is a puzzle and I don't think it should be ignored. Uh, that doesn't mean to say there aren't opportunities to earn money other ways and there's certainly, because it's a two-sided market, you'd expect some rebalancing, but still. Okay. Uh, what does, you know, that's one version of it. The other is sort of a psychological theory of ineffectiveness. It took me a bit of work to find this sort of example. But this is the same thing. This Boston Sunday Globe actual print edition, there's an ad for Citizen Bank. Very expensive ad in a print newspaper. On the same day, an ad appears for Citizen Bank on the Boston.com website. 
uh, the equivalent thereof. So the psychological theory goes that as you move from that ad, from the print medium to the ad on the web page or on the iPad or whatever other thing it goes, it is somehow 50 times less effective. 50 <laughs> times less, less effective. Now, as an economist, we're always, I'm always puzzled about that ads work anyway. Uh, so I'm not, in no position to evaluate this theory. Um, it's just that every time, so some, some marketing folks, especially this consumer behavior folks, have looked at this and they've never been able to find. They, actually, they haven't been able to find any drop off in effectiveness. If you do the ads the right way, they actually become more effective. They get more retained, they get more uh, resulting end sales and things like that. So it's it, reason to doubt that, you know, this idea that as you move from a paper medium to, to digital, that they, just because of that, it's less effective, just doesn't seem to a ring of plausibility. Another theory that gets put forward, not very often, fortunately, but here it is in the New York Times, is about the supply of ad inventory. Online ads sell at rates that are a fraction of those for print for simple reasons of competition. In a print world, you had pretty much a limited amount of inventory, pages in a magazine, says some guy. In the all online world, inventory has become infinite. There's so much out there, it's supply to the, what is it, it was demand to the sand, supply to the sky, supply to the floor, uh, falls all the way down, uh, you know, you can't possibly hope to earn any money for these things. Now, obviously, that is incorrect, because fundamentally an ad is only effective if it's seen by someone. And it's going to be seen by someone uh, who, we all have limited attention, there's only so many, we can't see an infinite amount of ads. Therefore, the price can't go to zero. It can only go to how many ads we can consume. So, but you do hear this sort of discussion. And in fact, this seems to be very per persuasive. Every time I go to a conference and somebody says, well, there's supply all over the place. We can't do anything. But, you know, but there's still, I know there are a lot of people in the world, but they still have limited attention. So when you come back to the economic fundamentals, attention is still scarce, OK? Attention is still scarce. People have only so much time they can devote to media. And, and moreover, advertisers still want to access that attention. There's nothing has changed about that. They still would like to get their slice of that. Okay? So in terms of the supply and demand for advertising, again, it's a puzzle as to why we've seen such a huge drop off uh, in this industry where advertising worked for a, for a century with no, no particular problem. Okay, so obviously the, the, the issue here is we're going to say that there's a problem with the advertising market. The advertising market is not working properly and trying to identify what it is about the internet that has led to that. But let me first give you why this is important. The traditional business uh, model of media markets, and you hear it time and time again by media moguls in particular, is you establish a platform like the Boston Globe, you create content, and the idea is if you create good content, people will come and view it, and all going well, you could actually charge them for that content. Of course, once you've got their attention, you can also place some ads in front of them and sell access to the consumers you have captured through that content and earn some money from that. And if that money is enough, you actually want to get more consumers. And how do you get more consumers viewing the content you, um, I'll come back to this, you reduce price. And so in a two-sided market, this becomes the focus of investment and competition, trying to catch more eyeballs, okay? This becomes a competitive bottleneck. Once you've captured a consumer, you can charge, advertise the monopoly price to access those consumers. And you get here uh, an effect called the waterbed effect. If there's a problem on this side of the market that you can no longer extract as much revenue for the consumers, like a waterbed, you know, uh, I guess the analogy would be you, you stepped up from one part of the, you, you pushed, well, no, you pushed down on one part of the waterbed, you'll be able to make it back up here because it's no longer worthwhile giving away lower prices to compete for, for, the, uh, for, for the readers because they're just not as valuable to you anymore. Okay, and so much of the so all of the discussion and the, you know that Neiman Labs uh, report was was basically you know we've lost this, 
Now we've got to work out how to make this work so the people will pay. So it's all the waterbed effect. Rupert Murdoch will tell you the same thing. We're imposing paywalls because this is gone and we now need to earn money here. And which, you know, has an economic rationale to it. Okay? Because each re new reader brings in a new revenue stream and that's how the business has worked. It's just that those ch has changed, therefore we do it differently. Another part says, um, puts this in all the language of disruption. And so if you listen to Clay Shirky, for instance, he will say that the internet has disrupted the traditional business model and if you go all the way back to Gutenberg and the scribes and whatever, this has happened before and when you're in periods of disruption, people need to experiment and will eventually sort out what the new world is going to be, but I can't tell you what that's going to be because it's very disruptive. And again, if you go to newspaper people talking, it says, we've been told for the last decade that we're in this process of disruption. Aren't we done being disrupted yet? When is this going to end? And they've all, and they've engaged in these experiments as well. And they're all the experiments they've engaged in is on the, uh, on the paywall side. How do we get people to pay more? Okay. We had this one, which was MBA Economics 101. This is actually what, if you read Shapiro and Berry, and it would be the first thing that comes to mind, you, would, you, you, should, you should say, what do you do uniquely, New York Times, that people would really value and therefore pay for? Oh, I know, Paul Krugman. And so they had this thing called Time Select, where you paid for the premium content that was unique. Turned out didn't quite work. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, they were unique and this is the obvious thing to charge a higher price for, but it didn't really, wasn't as unique as they thought maybe. The other solution is of course to have a straight out paywall. I can't show you the times in London because I'm not a subscriber, but if you pay a pound, um, you can access it. They've done that to the whole paywall for that uh, organization. They did that a few years ago. Um, by some reports, 95 to 98% of their online traffic disappeared. But of course, if you're earning nothing from advertising, now you're earning a bit from the 2% uh, paying for this. It's better than nothing, okay? But there's, that's another way to do it, but it hasn't been attractive for, for everybody. What's been more uh, attractive has been a limited paywall, such as the Financial Times done and now the New York Times do, where they allow you to have a certain number of views per month, and then if you want to have more, you pay for that. That's turned out to be quite successful, I, I was a bit worried about it because I thought people would be then not going to the New York Times for fear of uh, thinking that every, whether a, a new article is going to be click-worthy or not and whether they should use it as their 20 allocation or what have you. But um, as it turned out, a lot of people were taking these newspapers because they were getting all their daily content from it. And so once you've accepted that that's, you're going, to, that's going to be your exclusive curator, you might pay for it. I think that's what's going on there. Same reason people pay for The Economist, even though it's a week out of date. Um, in uh, the UK, they've tried, of course, giving up on paywalls entirely and focusing on the meagre advertising revenue. And the Daily uh, Mail uh, does that. Uh, it's a huge site. It gets, uh, I think it's the second or largest traffic news site in the world. Um, but earning money off, uh, off, uh, off ads, basically, as you click through. And you've had this other one. Uh, there was a group of... Russian business people who took over some newspapers in the UK, including the London Evening Standard, they've given up on online entirely. The London Evening Standard is, sold, is, is free, but offline. It's a given away at, at subway stations. Uh, and uh, the, the idea is they sell advertising for that. So it's back to the old model, but not online. And of course, if the advertising that is valuable, I guess that's not a bad strategy. But it's and moreover, what's really good about that is you don't even have to print uh, as many copies as you do readers because people leave them on the tube for other people to read. And so you're even economizing in that, in that way as well. But of course, this is only as effective as people don't have anything else to do on the tube because there's no good cell phone coverage going on there. And then that's, that's changing as well. So you've seen these experiments. Now, none of them has taken the world by storm, but some of them are starting to grow in terms of, of that. So we are seeing that. All right. That said, what about the ad side of the market? Yeah. Is there an aspect, something like a newspaper to pay while the telling us that the see your market? Oh, yes. <laughs> no, I'm not going to get to that here, but that was a, that's a theme in my 
my book, in fact. I mean, I don't know why people consume the news. Um, it seems to me that one of the reasons you want to consume the news is so you can chat about it with other people. If the news is locked behind a paywall and you don't know if your friends consume it, uh, you lose that value. They lose that value, you lose that value. They can, they can also change as well. So that's a whole other matter of which I'm, I, I'm qualified to speculate in a blog post, but not qualified to talk about in an academic seminar, really. <laughs> All right, so, oh, yeah. Oh, is that a reasonable strategy that you see that, you know, you can access the time via Twitter and you're not limited by the number of articles, or if you know how to duplicate the URL, then you can access it. You know, that's a premium well, certainly, certainly the access by Twitter or, or Facebook links or blog links, for that matter, uh, seems to be uh, a way of doing that. And, uh, and if that's the case, if that's how they thought of it, that's, that's, that's good. What's interesting is, of course, they started with 20 articles and they reduced it to 10, and I'm trying to work out how that all fits in with that. So I'm not 100% sure that's what they had in mind, but it is one of the benefits that they've got there, it seems to me. Right. And said, well, we put these two together and we have a picture of the newspaper industry. But is that fair? Oh, well, I, I don't know if I would go so far as to call any of this data. Um, it, it just is uh, <laughs> some anecdotes, really, to, to, mo to motivate everything. I think what, what is fair is, is it doesn't matter where you are in the world the advertising revenue has fallen off for the newspapers uh, as people have gone online. Um, well, I wanted to show there where there's this range of experiments, some of which have been done in the UK rather than the US, that have, have been ones, the sort of things you see in a disruptive event, but they're all been focused on the pay, war, pay side of the, the market. Uh, the subscription numbers are all the US, yeah, the, the US data. Right. There. So, so I, I can't, well, I can't, can't recall. I remember um, in, so the Financial Times has certainly climbed since I put in that paywall. I don't know what's happened with the other ones. I know with the online digital revenues for the Times of London collapsed after they put in a paywall, but I don't know the, the other bits. I can tell you also in Australia, they've had the circulation declines. Uh, Okay. So anyway, I, I'm not I'm not sure of that. I'm I'm so so. I'm uh, so our focus actually has mostly been the U.S. and sort of thinking about this. Uh, there might be some nuances, but as I understand it, that regardless of how other things have happened, the loss to advertising as you moved onto the internet it seems fairly universal. So the uh, main hypothesis that we want to put forward is this. And you have to, in order to believe this hypothesis, uh, or to construct the hypothesis, you only have to sort of believe two facts about the world. The first fact is that the internet has facilitated what we're going to call consumer switching between outlets. So whereas in the olden days, you would read one newspaper, and that would be the newspaper you read, uh, you know from your own behavior uh, that's no longer the case. You, a lot of people pick and choose different news from different outlets. The second thing you need to believe is that there is imperfect tracking between outlets. Uh, and that is, you know, outlets only have very limited information about what people have been doing with the rest of their time. And I'll, I'll make both of those notions precise. So in terms of switching, why is there more switching? Well, the browser does it already, by, by, almost by definition. There is now free content, which allows people to switch easily between different outlets. And there are aggregators, social networks, and search, which are actually increasing variety. Um, Susan Athey presented a talk last week uh, documenting some of the evidence from that. Here's a, a graph based on some of that same data. This is news aggregator usage as it increased, and this is the Herfindahl of concentration of various uh, uh, um, readers of, uh, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Yahoo News. Um, uh, and, and, and where they went afterwards. 
And basically, as you use news aggregators more, you spread more thinly your attention across outlets. So all those uh, things, and I don't think it's a, a hard hypothesis that people are consuming a greater variety is one of the things that is going on. And there's also greater variety for them to consume as well. What does this mean for traditional media economics? Traditional media economics has something to say about when you have outlets competing against one another. So if you take the Boston Globe and you add an outlet that might compete against it, such as the Washington Post, they have their own content, and in traditional media economics, they siphon off part of the market, and then they get to get the monopoly stream of ad revenues per consumer for those side of the, for, for that market. The, the consumers are basically either consuming one outlet or the other. Uh, and what does, that, what does that imply? Well, that implies that you know, they will compete heavily for these consumers, um, capture, capture their attention, one or the other. But the advertisers, if you're like Zipcar here, and you want to access every consumer, you say, okay, the market's now split between these two. I'll have to advertise on both outlets, and I'm going to have to pay whatever it takes. Of course, the competition here might drive prices down even further, maybe nominally to zero, okay? Uh, between these outlets, it's hard to get the money from the consumers but because you're competing for them to order to get the money from the advertisers. And this is a model uh, that was pioneered by Anderson and Coate uh, in a paper published in 2005, and it's really the workhorse of media economics. So, the problem with this model is not just that we're going to have an issue with um, advertising. Oh, let me tell you the issue of advertising. If this model is true and you add more and more of these outlets here, chopping up the market for readers into finer and finer bits, the advertisers advertise across all of them, but when you add up how much the advertisers are paying, it doesn't change. Okay? So you can have this increased competition, all of the price effects of competition flow on this side of the market. The prediction of this model is none of it happens on this other side of the market. Okay. Now, this is going to suggest, of course, that this model is wrong, and we're going to come to that. Um, but this model is not, has been known to be wrong before, just effects of the news media and the internet. For instance, it's had puzzles associated with it. For instance, there's evidence actually out there that competition does reduce ad prices. So when you get more competing outlets, ad prices do tend to come down per consumer. The outlets themselves, when they are arguing before the... DOJ or EC or whatever about that they should be able to merge, and this is not just newspaper outlets but the television channels and so on and so forth, they claim that the mergers, one of the reasons they want to merge is they will improve ad revenue. So the converse of the other story that competition is leading to no change in ad revenue means that if you merge you don't get to, you don't increase ad revenue either, you're already getting as much as you're going to get. However, they go to the <laughs> competition authorities and say one of the reasons we want to merge is to improve ad revenue, and don't worry, therefore the consumers will be able to have their same old low prices for subscriptions. For-profit outlets often object when public, broadca restrictions, uh, public broadcasters have the restriction on their advertisers removed, advertising removed. This is really bizarre, because remember, the public broadcasters are being subsidized by the government therefore don't have to have any of those annoying ads, and therefore get more viewers that are surely competing with the for-profit ones. Yet, if the German broadcasters are sudden, uh, public broadcasters now allowed to advertise after eight, who screams blue murder? The private ones. Why should they be doing that? Okay, why should they be doing that unless there's some competitive effect in the ad market. In other words, when you lift the ad restrictions, there's now another place for advertisers to advertise on, and there's some competitive effect going on. Large outlets typically earn higher ad revenue per consumer. That's also a puzzle, because there's nothing about how you chop up the consumers with competing outlets that matters. Okay, you should earn the same amount per reader. Every reader that you have to acquire will give you the same amount in ad revenue. But it turns out large outlets have some advantages. Now, this is a harder thing to explain. Okay, so there have been these puzzles, and there have been puzzles for us as well. So what do we do in this paper? We take this traditional model, and this is where I reduce all the sexy, interesting language down to something completely boring. Here's what we're going to do. I already told you before that the 
consumers aren't behaving in this way. They're not choosing one outlet or another. What they're doing is they're mixing. So there might be some consumers who just choose one or the other, but some of them, others are switching between the outlets. Okay? And we want to know what effect that change in behavior has on the incentives of the advertisers to ha go everywhere and feel the need to, to spread the advertising across all these outlets. And subsequently, what's the effect on the dollars going from advertising? Okay? With the hypothesis being that by changing the model this way, we get a change in this behavior that leads to a reduction in, in revenue. But it turns out it takes a bit of work to get there. Okay. So, so, I'm sorry. so I just want to understand your main hypothesis. So if, if you try to put it in a single sentence, is it that because consumers are switching media sources, that's resulting in less revenue? So I want to take fact consumers switching between media sources, then a miracle of stuff happens that I will explain, lower ad revenue. And so what we want to fit, fit in is this middle part of the story, which I haven't told you how, okay. how so we fill that in. No, no. So we have the hypothesis, yeah, the hypothesis, but it's got to be that the two assumptions you need to believe is the switching bit, which I guess we're all on board on. Then it's going to have something to do with imperfect tracking, which I'll have to define for you. And that's going to be in the mix that gets you this reduction. Overall reduction, total even industry revenue. Obviously, competition means that each individual bit is getting less. That's, but that's not what the graph is telling us. The graph is telling us that the whole industry is being blasted to bits. OK. Let me set up the model. The model is actually quite a simple setup. And uh, I'm going to use a little bit of notation, but I hopefully won't be too onerous. I know there are diverse people in the audience. OK. So we have to model the advertising market, which believe it or not, has rarely been done in economics. You know, using proper advertising supply and advertising demand. Here's what happens on the supply side. They've got consumers. They've got two attention periods, OK? So the consumers look like this. They consume some media content in the morning. They consume some media content in the afternoon. And then they go shopping. That's it. For the morning and afternoon, they see A units of ads, then another A units of ads, and that's it. So they can be shown in total two A units of ads. The consumers look at something in the morning, and then they roll a dice. Well, not really, dice. flip a coin. Actually, it'll turn out flipping a coin. The coin's heads. They stay with the same outlet. At the coin's tail, they switch to a different outlet in the afternoon. And in any given period, the probability that a consumer can, has this opportunity to flip a coin is going to be a parameter rho. In other words, I want to have a situation where if rho was zero, you don't have an opportunity to flip the coin, so you must stay with the same outlet. If rho is equal to one, you have as per, uh, you have a definite opportunity to do that. So we can vary rho and say this is a proxy for the degree of switching that is technologically enabled. That means that you have two sorts of consumers. Well, actually three. You have, imagine we're just going to have two outlets. I'm going to keep it very, well, that's all there is in the paper. It's not a critical assumption. You've got customers that end up being observationally loyal to one outlet or the other. And you've got customers that switch between the two. And these are define the probabilities of that based on this model. Details of that are actually less critical, so I'm not going to harp on it. But what this means is that if you're an outlet, I, the amount of ad inventory that you've got available to sell under that sort of behavior is if you've got loyal customers, for loyal customers, you can sell 2A inventory because you get them in the morning and the afternoon and you can sell ad space to advertisers for all that. For the switches, you only get them for one of the periods. So you can only sell that much. Okay? But overall, the market has got the same amount regardless of this division. It's just what an individual outlet controls. Okay. What about on the advertiser demand side? Advertisers, they care. They're all kind of the same. They want to hit every consumer, so they're not discriminatory. They don't say, oh, I just want to hit a share of consumers or anything like that. They would have other things, but 
I want to hit every consumer. But they only want to hit them once, because they're only going shopping once. And they've got perfect memory about what they've read, seen in the ads in the morning and the afternoon. So you only have to hit them once, and then you're happy. And it's an assumption in the model you hit them once. Obviously, real advertisers like to barrage consumers more than that, but eventually they like to stop. Okay, so one is, is where this model pins it on. Um, the advertisers uh, have different values, though, on hitting consumers. So some advertisers, I don't know, BMW, or actually it will turn out AT&T, have high values of hitting consumers. Uh, other advertisers don't care as much, and there's a straight line between them. Okay. So that's going to allow us to have a demand curve. So there's some advertisers who are going to be in the market, and some advertisers who will be excluded from the market for that reason. Okay. And otherwise, that I'm going to advertise before you start thinking about it, this paper is advertising loving. Advertising works exactly as intended. You give it to consumers, it has the effect that you have on it, all with certainty, no blah, 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 no problems there. Um, it's not annoying to consumers, which is something we could build in, but we've taken away here. It's an advertising loving paper uh, in every other assumption, other than how the market works. Okay. This next slide pretty much will now indicate where the hypo the mixed black box is coming from, but a uh, question. I don't want to cut you off. Okay. So, the problem that this all sets up uh, for advertisers, the advertisers have a dilemma. They now have to play a game. Okay? So you've got outlet one, outlet two, and you've got morning and afternoon as the two attention periods. We have a consumer comes in in the morning and goes to outlet one. They get shown an ad. Okay, well, they get show ads, but let's, they get shown an ad, ad. Okay, now, if you're a, a, a website, you know this consumer's been there in the morning, and if the consumer stays in the afternoon, uh, you can make sure that they see a different ad in the afternoon. Great, no mess, no fuss, that's sensible. But our consumers, as we pointed out, are annoying. They might switch between, they might view the Starbucks ad in the morning and switch in the afternoon. Now, Outlet number two doesn't have information of what the consumer has seen in the morning, and the consumer apparently is not telling them. Now, it could all work out, and they see a different ad, in which case, fine. But of course, if Starbucks were advertising on both outlets, this can happen. Starbucks has wasted an ad, okay? And it doesn't have this, you know, this is stylized, so it's not really going to have an opportunity to change its strategy. I know that Carl has seen an ad in the morning, I'm going to change it. Uh, the whole thing. It's not working like that. So you could have some ways. So Starbucks has a dilemma. If it does what it you always did and advertise on both outlets, it's going to pay for some ads that aren't worth it to them. That reduces the amount on average that it wants to pay for ads. Of course, it could maybe choose so much to do that that actually it will just advertise on one outlet. And if it was a high-valued advertiser and decides to no longer advertise on both outlets and relieve some space, what's going to come in? A lower value ad advertiser. Again, pushing down prices. So if Starbucks single homes just advertises on one outlet, it misses some impressions from the loyal consumers and maybe even some of the switches. If Starbucks multi homes, it's going to end up wasting some impressions. So this impression game is there and is at the core of this. And because you have to play this game, and because you can't play it perfectly well, there's a mechanism involved in it, it's going to end up reducing the demand for advertising. And there's a sense in which we could all go home now, because that's going to give us everything else that's going to follow from that. But I'm, I guess we're not going to go home, because I want to torture you some more. Uh, I got to go soon, so. Oh, OK. Let's <laughs> Right. And it seems like as soon as you say switching cost is lower, you get rid of that monopoly. So that would be the less problem how we have to have If the switching costs were lower. Yeah. Right. Uh, 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 well, it could. I mean, it, so the, the, uh, this would probably take too long to go into, but just in terms of the, the, in the way that this model works, which is working as a, uh, as a sort of pure market model rather than a bargaining model, that doesn't happen. Uh, could it happen in a bargaining model? I, I don't think so, but I don't want to speculate. I don't want to go through it standing up here with my IQ lower as a result. Yeah. 
No, they don't have a monopoly on the viewers. So Starbucks is sitting there saying, I want to advertise on the New York Times. In fact, that's what, where I got that ad from. It was the New York Times. Um, Starbucks advertised there. Who knew? Um, uh, but, but, but the Starbucks is sitting there saying, well, we could advertise in the New York Times, but you know, these consumers might travel somewhere else and go to some other outlet later on. Uh, I, shouldn't, you know, I should take that into account. I can't, I'm not going to pay what I paid before for it. Yeah. If the uh, New York Times and the Boston Globe uh, both have their ads served up by DoubleClick, yes, ad company, right? Then it would be possible, right, for DoubleClick to follow the switchers, right? And right. Serve, how does that affect? I'm gonna I'm gonna get to that in two slides. Maybe we can at least state the full hypothesis. Well, this is pretty much, well, we're getting, we're pretty much at it with this slide, but I, I need to, to show you the full mechanism because there's a few, few wrinkles to get to this, this point. But let me, let, me, let me just point out in terms of, let me just step back a second and say, is this real? Is this sort of thing happening? So uh, my uh, embedded in Microsoft co-author pulled from Comscore some campaigns from a, 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 a large branded <laughs> customer of what, what the, uh, what the uh, advertiser, what they were trying to do. And they uh, looked at the percentage of impressions that were shown to consumers who saw a certain number of exposures. And, the, and they noticed that basically a whole lot of consumers were seeing one exposure and a lot were seeing over 10. Okay? But actually what they were trying to do as advertisers is get most people to see between three and five. So all this was kind of wasted from their point of view, seeing too few or seeing too many. So the way I've put it at the moment is you just want to get one impression. That's kind of an easy task. What if you want to get an optimal number of impressions? It's like really, really hard. Okay. The other thing that, in terms of evidence that we know that people are acting this way is when you look at the raw statistics of what the advertising numbers look for uh, in, uh, on the internet disp for display ads. For this is not for ads that people want to click the display ads. Basically, it was, um, oh, now I've, I've forgotten, I, I, I heard this just the other day. I think it's something like, a, oh, so, so basically, the average person in the United States sees uh, 16,000 16, ads a year <laughs> served up on the internet, 16, 45 a day. Uh, the largest buyer of uh, those impressions, and you only pay for them when they're actually served up, is AT&T. And they have 100 billion, <laughs> is how many they buy. Now they buy those many ads precisely because they're cheap, <laughs> but they're doing it. So on average, everyone here is seeing 500 AT&T ads a year, on average. If you throw your, your grandparents into the mix, that means you're actually seeing a lot more, <laughs> you guys. Now, you can't tell me 500 is the sweet spot for at and I don't know. If everybody's an at and customer, maybe it is, but I don't think it is. So it's this game being played. Um, so there's some advertisers flooding the market with ads in the hope of hitting consumers, literally, wherever they are. Other, people, other ones won't be doing that, which is, of course, what makes this all tricky. Okay. There are lots of ways once you pose this dilemma that the advertisers are facing of trying to effectively hit the consumers. Lots of ways of thinking of how to solve it. One would be to stop anyone from switching. <laughs> Don't be killing. That is exactly behind the paywall at the Times of London. Because then we know that these guys are paying for this and therefore they're more likely to be there on that side a lot and they're not switching so you, they're premium advertisers. Uh, another was if you, uh, actually I better not go into this, is if you didn't know anything about the consumers at all, they were jumping around your own site and you didn't know, turns out to actually resolve this, but I'm not going to go into that. Now there's coordination in time, I said there's the morning, the afternoon, oh I know it, just advertising the morning. 
There are advertisers who do that, certainly on radio and other things like that, or the Super Bowl. But, you know, if you think about web browsing and stuff like that, the morning and uh, afternoon is hypothesized. My morning is different from your morning uh, in terms of time of what we would describe as it. So it's harder to do. If you could go to pay-per-click, of course, you can solve this. You're only paying for the click, but these display ads are not pay-per-click. They're not pay-per-click because whatever they're doing is through the display of them, not through the click-through rate. It's not like search advertising. Or you could, as was already now suggested, what if we had perfect tracking? Okay. So this is an idealized ad market. How would that work? You have some technology like a browser plugin. It could be many other ways. You send vi consumer visits to a network like DoubleClick, okay? And you have no wasted impressions. Why? Because every impression is being served up by a common network regardless of the uh, outlet that it's being displayed upon and they're tracking the consumers and so they can resolve the thing to ensure that you don't see a Starbucks ad twice. Okay? This is great news because if you plug this into uh, you know, the economic model, what you can give as an offer to advertisers, you can say, we will impress a specific consumer X times in a specified time, at a specified time period regardless of the site. Give this like idealized offer. You know, don't, I don't care where they are, we'll get the ad in front of them. To the outlet, you can say, you do what you do best. Get people coming to your sites and then you'll get a share of the pool of advertising revenue coming from this model. Okay, very straightforward, clean, model. There's some wrinkles of how you'd actually implement this, but it's, it's very clean. The outcomes, the advertisers have a straightforward strategy. They pay for impressions. They get impressions. No waste, no problems. The outlets have a uh, strategy. They just outsource their ad sales. They give up their ad sales department and they just compete for readers, just as they're supposed to do. This would all be wonderful, but there are impediments. One impediment is, as it turns out, it might actually reduce advertisers' demand. Remember I told you about AT&T? they're not going to buy that many impressions anymore. Okay? And that can have an effect uh, on that. So it's not clear that the outlets really want this, and I'll come back to that. And, of course, there are concerns over privacy. Um, this involves knowing uh, somebody collecting information about all the sites that people have visited and the ads that they have seen and who knows how or what else. What that means is uh, this is not going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> okay? Uh, the, so we can envisage a way, and a technically feasible way, of probably solving all of this, but there are impediments to getting it adopted that I think are relevant, and certainly relevant right up to the date of trying to explain this decline. Although, maybe the policy response is to think about how to do this. And of course, it's also hard to think about how to do this with, just, with more than one of the ad networks. Do we really want to add all of this to double-click? I don't think so. So there's another issue as well. But the good news about it is if you plug this into the profit function for the outlets, so there's a profit function that they get from the no switching environments where they have loyal consumers, they charge them a price based on a supply of 2A uh, units into the market. That's their profits. And the perfect tracking, you can work it out. They've got switches they're getting a price from, they've got loyals they're getting a price from. These things might not be the same especially if there are symmetries between outlets on various dimensions, most importantly, how many ads that they can serve up to consumers. But if you took that away, you can simplify and simplify again and show that you could actually get to the same outcomes as the sort of apparent nirvana of no switching. So what this is saying is it's, the, it's, it, it's not enough, just because there are switches between outlets is not enough to create the decline in ad revenue. It's that the tracking is imperfect between the outlets that is creating, that is creating the problem as well. Because if you had perfect tracking, it wouldn't be an issue. So what does a realistic ad market look like? Turns out to be quite challenging to think about that. Very, very challenging, actually. Because how tracking occurs within an outlet is an open question. At the early days of the internet, they used to not know who was viewing a web page in the morning and the afternoon on an outlet, let alone between outlets. One thing a newspaper has, a printed newspaper has, is it has perfect track, it has some tracking built into it. That's why I can go to a website and I see AT&T ads all the time on each page, but I don't see AT&T ads on every page of a newspaper because they're expecting me to read it from cover to cover 
and therefore to see these ads in progression. So there's a natural equivalent of tracking going on. There's a tracking that, uh, so you know, you could imagine that the, the outlets could put in very perfect tracking into their sites to know exactly what all the consumers, as soon as they come to their sites, have seen and optimize the ads for that. But in reality, what they do is they can sort of do something which is basically frequency based, where they give uh, advertisers offers how many times do you want to advertise per consumer on an outlet? Because you might want to advertise more than once in case the consumers move off in the afternoon and you want to capture them in the morning or vice versa, and you don't know if you've really got them. And that's the sort of closest thing that's going on. But the important part is actually just to show you what it means, our assumptions in notation. The key variable is, if you pursue a certain advertising strategy, what is your expected number of unique impressions that you get, which is remember what you're trying to do. If you single home, you get all of the loyals on an outlet. If you single home, advertise on just one outlet only and with one impression, I don't care whether it's morning or afternoon, just show it to a consumer. You'll get all the loyals on the outlet and you'll get half the switches. Why? Because you'll miss out because some of the switches go off and, 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 uh, and, and, and you miss showing them an ad because you just haven't been in the right place at the right time. You can have one ad on each outlet. If you do that, you get all the loyals because you've said to each outlet, advertise to everybody and you've got two periods to do it. But you'll still miss some of the switches and the reason you'll miss some of the switches is because the outlets don't know whether to be in the morning or afternoon and your guys could have switched over and seen the impression twice or switched over and missed it entirely, even if you're multi-homing. But you can solve that if you take one of the outlets and you put two impressions, advertise in the morning and the afternoon and the other outlet, one or the other. In that situation, you grab everybody because you grab all the loyals and also the switches you'll capture on the second on the outlet you're sort of given more advertising to. So there's three sorts of uh, strategies there. The key thing is that actually multi-homing is going to get you fewer and unique impressions than hypothetically splitting up the single homing because you've got a diminishing return to multi-homing. So what's that look like on a demand and supply diagram? So here's price and here's the quantity in terms of advertisers. One of the challenges it turned out here, was to work out what to put on the price and quantity axis. Um, because you can have quantity of advertisers, and I'm going to show you in another one, it's more convenient to do quantity of impressions. They're different things. For single homing advertisers, if they advertise and they hit a consumer, they're willing to pay how much that was to hit that consumer. That was the demand curve. But to impress the loyals on both outlets, because they're missing those if they're just on one outlet, They'll want to multi-home, but they get that the cost of wasted impressions. So the willingness to pay, on average for an advertiser, uh, an ad if you're a multi-homer, is lower. If you're wanting to get more of the market, you want to be more like AT&T, you'll increase the frequency on one of the outlets, but that'll be the cost of now you're advertising, some of your loyals are going to see advertising too much. And so that'll reduce your advertising demand further. If we imagine that the price of advertising cut through here, we can see that within the market we will have a mix of advertisers. The highest value advertisers who want to impress the, who place the most weight on impressing a consumer will wear the costs associated with multi-homing at some extra frequency. And so they'll pay for that. The next tranche will just multi-home and the advertisers who are the lowest value but still in the market will just single home. They'll get some ads on some outlet, but no more than that. They don't find it worthwhile to bear the costs of trying to acquire the consumers. Okay, so higher value advertisers are more willing to bear costs, which gives you a structure to this market that allows us to analyze it. What does that mean? What does it mean in terms of time? Oof. <laughs> I'm not going to get to all the juicy bits, the controversial at this rate. I'm going to have to see how we go. Okay. If we choose quantity of impressions here, the most number of impressions per consumer you can show is 2A. So the supply of total ads in the market is fixed. If we start off with the case of no switching, basically, um, here's value. All of the advertisers are going to be multi-homers. Because if I'm advertising on one outlet 
and then I'm thinking of bidding for the scarce space on another outlet, I don't care. The, the, uh, the, the, consumer is worth the, the consumer on outlet one is worth the same to me as the consumer on outlet two. So all of the, if an advertiser found it worthwhile to bid for a consumer on outlet one, they'll find it worthwhile, since all consumers are the same for it, to bid on, for a consumer on outlet two, and they'll exclude everybody else. So multi-homers will cover the whole market, which is basically what the traditional media economics model says. What happens is you get switches. As you get switches, the value of multi-home income goes down. And so that means that that advertiser who is just missing out on an outlet, because their value is just a little bit below the market price, now the advertiser that outbid them has a lower marginal value for that impression. And so now they can switch. They can now bid into that market. Without changing the uh, single homer's price, they can now capture, the, they can be the marginal price setters. Now remember, those guys have lower value. If the marginal consumer before, a marginal advertiser before had $5 of value, and the next one had $4.99, well, as you've allowed the $4.99 come in, they're not going to pay more than that. So the market price falls. The market price falls because advertising demand has fallen. Okay? And so that's basically the hypothesis. As you get more switches, you get a reduction in ad revenue. That's it. That's the rest of the black box. Sadly, not quite. <laughs> Because as it always is, when you, that has a strong intuition, but when you put it into a model, you discover more things. That works if you start from no switching to a little bit of switching. This happens. However, what if you get more and more switches? Remember the at and T's of the world. What was causing them to want to hit more and more outlets and, uh, and increase frequency? The desire to get switches. So as you get more switches, the AT&Ts of the world are willing to bid for multi-homing plus frequency. They aren't down here, they're up there. So if these guys now start bidding for ad space and getting it, they are going to displace some of these guys down the bottom. What that means... No, no, there isn't, it's just effect. <laughs> I'm just trying to show the division in the market of advertisers. Yeah, so it's not, it's not a standard economics chart of any meaning other than trying to show groups here. So those guys come into the market. They outbid the lower ones, but of course that must by definition bid the price up. So the price rises again. So you could have increased switching leading to higher advertising revenue, but that only happens if A is very high. Why do you need A high? Because A being high means that if you're always going to use all that ad capacity, which is an issue, um, prices are going to be low enough to make that worthwhile. What this means is the profits as a function of switches, and the profits are only coming for advertising here, look like this. In imperfect, imperfect tracking as compared to that imperfect tracking, when there's low ad capacity, but when there's high ad capacity, they can look like that. <laughs> so much show that in, in, it's theoretically possible that you actually earn more from imperfect tracking than you would under even no switching. So it can happen here. So, and this AT&T behavior is maybe an example of that. Now, obviously the chart in the data looks like this part. <laughs> Is there going to be an explosion soon as there are more switches, is what the model is saying. Do I believe that? No. And I'll tell you why. Because this relies on that ad capacity not only being high, but being used. And in other work where we're sort of trying to, you know, choose your ad capacity, you'll never choose it that high. You'll never want, as the New York Times, to have so many ads that you ended up under competition into this space, even though it'd be good if you could collude and do so somehow. Anyway, so, that, so there's a bit of a wrinkle. There's a, a thing coming up there. But nonetheless, if we focus in on this part, we can get, a, get some more insights. So, how is it, so, that, so that was a long way of trying to rationalize that chart and a, a lot of work, but you can see the hypothesis here. 
Switching plus imperfect tracking can get us the chart looking like that. Can it get us the magnitude by which the chart plummets off the cliff like that? No idea. So that with two outlets, a bit of switching and stuff, this model is not like quantitatively relevant. But what we've got is people moving from one newspaper to 20, <laughs> which is a whole different matter. What about uh, resolving other puzzles in media economics? What about mergers? Is this an environment where if the two outlets merge, they could increase advertising revenue? Well, for starters, it's got to allow intra-outlet intra uh, tracking is one way to think about that. You could think about the merge, sorry. Uh, you could think about the mergers as, um, as you merge, the Boston Globe and the New York Times um, up until a few months from now are commonly owned, they have the same they merge and they, they have the same uh, platform and they track people across the two of them. That'll change things. It's like moving to perfect tracking. Okay? But I've said already that only ma you might only want to get that perfect tracking outlet if there aren't that many switches or A is not too high. So it's, there's a nuance. Of course, you could, as they've done with the New York Times and Boston Globe, not merge the tracking. They were always separate. They haven't actually been able to track across those outlets. And in that case, nothing's going to happen. The only time that it can happen is if you can use the fact that you own both outlets to offer a bundle to advertisers. Because the multi-homers and the single-homers are different and you could price discriminate against them. And in that situation, you might actually be able to increase profits. Well, what's really interesting is in that situation, you could increase profits even if there were no switches by offering these sort of bundles uh, of, of things which sort of hadn't been noticed before. Let me give you another example. I said before the public broadcasters, when they started to offer ads, uh, you know, the private broadcasters didn't like it. Private media outlets also don't like blogs either. Now, blogs are typically not advertising bearing outlets. Now, they do sometimes carry ads now, but right in the early days when they were still being criticized as well, they were not uh, advertising bearing outlets. So, what does that mean? What happens if you have some share, the second outlet is not advertising and it becomes an advertiser? Or, or what happens actually, no, more to the point, what happens if you take an outlet that's advertising and you, they stop advertising altogether because they become a public broadcaster, the reverse? Well, in that situation, imagine we started off here in the market. So the blogs and other non-ad content come in to the market. What does that do? That takes the supply curve for in the advertising market and actually sorry, shifts, it to the, uh, shifts it to the left. Why? Because, remember, the total amount of supply of the market was the amount of ads that were being shown to consumers. Okay? If some of the, their attention is now being sucked up by blogs that aren't showing them ads, that means there's less ad supply in the market. There's less inventory to sell. That's good news for existing, uh, existing outlets, okay? Because there's less, uh, there's less ads being shown. Attention's being sucked up. So if you go and read a blog in the morning, then, it, uh, and then in the afternoon, that's the only chance for advertisers to get you when you read, go to the New York Times. But there's another effect as well. The whole problem with switching was I would switch, I'd see some ads in the morning, and I might see some different ads in the afternoon. If I go to a blog in the morning, I don't see ads. So there's no problem in the afternoon. So the adverse effect of switching is reduced, and so the demand also increases. This does not necessarily mean that blogs and public broadcasters competing for attention mean that there will be higher advertising revenue, because they are capturing attention. But it means that they will increase advertising prices. They're good for advertising prices. They come straight out of the model. Okay, that's something to be tested. I'd, you know, I'd love a PhD student to look at that at some point. That'd be good. Okay, see if the prices rise. Okay. The final thing I sort of want to focus on is positional advantage. Remember, I mentioned before that you know all outlets, big or small, were sort of equal players in the advertising market because they're all supposed to be capturing advertising dollars and being able to milk them as much as possible. Well, that doesn't actually happen. Why? Well, this model helps explain that too. It ha we can look at differences between outlets in terms of their content quality, and by quality I mean how, big, how many readers they have. Effect of paywalls, 
and also something called, we're going to call magnet content, but you can call it other things. So if we start from our situation here, this is just the diagram from before, where both outlets had the same quality, okay? What happens if we have outlet one have higher readership when people get to choose than outlet two? Okay, so it's the, you call it higher quality, but it could be lower quality or whatever, it just gets more readers, okay? What happens to these graphs is as follows. We get some shifting. There's still multi-homers who will advertise on both outlets. But now, if I'm going to choose an outlet to advertise just on, on its own, I want to advertise on the bigger outlet because if I'm single homing, I'm missing out on loyal consumers. Well, I want to miss out on the loyal consumers for the smaller outlet. So the higher value advertisers will end up on the bigger outlet and the lower value advertisers will end up on the lower outlet and so there'll be a price differential between the two. This is preserved even as people start bidding up on this outlet up here. It's preserved, but it takes some work. Why? Because if I'm going to multi-home with extra frequency, the cost of that extra frequency is wasted impression on loyal customers. So I want to go to the outlet that's smaller to flood the market with ads. So AT&T is not flooding the New York Times with ads. It's flooding all these other sites. So we get bigger outlets will earn more profits, comes out of this model. Okay. So outlet one effectively has a positional advantage. You can actually take that and think about the investment that might take place in advertising quality. And we have a potted game. Uh, to cut a long story short, under perfect tracking, you would invest a certain amount in getting a higher and higher quality in, in, interval in a sort of linear because you're just trying to capture readers. Under imperfect tracking, because of the positional advantage, it turns out you can actually show that you can have a higher incentive to invest in quality because you are not only capturing readers, but you're stealing it from other, you're stealing the readers from the other guy and you're gaining a positional advantage as well. You want to be the, the better outlet. Um, on to paywalls. What is the effect of paywalls in this? It's not a full analysis, but uh, this quote from Rupert Murdoch sort of gives you an indication. No, it's not a two-way street with Google sending traffic. What's the point of somebody coming occasionally who likes a headline they see on Google? Sure, we go out and we say we have millions of visitors. There's not enough advertising in the world to go around to make all the websites profitable. We'd rather have fewer people coming to our websites but paying. They don't suddenly become loyal readers of our website. So he says a paywall is some way of sorting through this switching issue. So how does that work? Well, the best way to do that is to think about outlets as uh, consumers of having differential ways of switching between outlet. If they go to outlet one in the morning, they might have a different probability of switching to outlet two than if they did the reverse. And this can be engendered by paywalls. So you can imagine a situation where you had micropayments, where every time you had to view an article you had to pay, was one sort of paywall. That would push, if outlet one did that, it would push up uh, the incentive to go to outlet one in the morning and go to a different outlet in the afternoon, and it would push down the incentive if you went to the free outlet in the morning to stay there in the afternoon. If you have subscriptions, you have an incentive if you've gone to the free outlet in the morning and you're thinking of consuming content in the afternoon, you're asked to pay a subscription that's supposed to cover both, you're less likely to do that. If you have a limited paywall, such as the Times has, and if you consume a little bit of content in, uh, uh, in the morning, it's not going to harm you, and then you pay if you want to stay in the afternoon, it'll increase your desire to not do that. <laughs> All of these changes, it turns out, will end up driving readers away, loyal readers away from outlet one relative to outlet two, which there's all sorts of effects going on, but one effect that has, according to our previous slide, is it gives you less ability to earn ad revenue per consumer. So paywalls and that are, are operating at that level, not just at an overall market level. So paywalls may actually cause you a position or disadvantage in advertising market, which basically suggests your, uh, the market is going to evolve into the situation where some people are just pure subscription and have no ads, or you know, can't earn much from ads, and, and the other is the opposite, even more so than before. Okay, so one more thing. Magnet content. This is the, this is the important part in terms of where this is all going. 
Everything thus far has thought of these outlets as kind of the same in that they have a full breadth of news to offer. But what if outlet two had limited content? And by limited content, if a consumer came, it could only hold their attention for one period, morning, afternoon. In other words, they never have a chance to have loyal consumers keeping their attention throughout the whole day. So the New York Times, you can spend 30 minutes reading it, but some of these sites, you just, there's not enough content there to capture your attention to it. What if that was the way the market was? Okay, so they can only serve one period of attention. Now why am I doing this is I'm going to suggest that there may be some evolution in terms of your incentives to be a full content provider versus something more limited. So imagine that row equals one, so we had no friction. Um, so people were real switches. Then under these assumptions, there's no loyal consumers to outlet number two. Uh, there are switches, and, and if, if you visited outlet number two in the morning, you're definitely a switcher for the afternoon. The way our advertisers uh, shape up there depends on the quality of outlet two. If their limited co content is a very low quality, so there's a low probability of that, so there are a lot of loyal consumers consuming the New York Times and nobody consuming I can has cheeseburger or something, okay, then I don't have time to sort of go into this allocation, but this is the way the market looks. Basically, that big full content provider will be able to earn a premium in the advertising market, as expect, kind of expected. Notice that on outlet number two, there are people single homing there, but they'll single home and they'll advertise in the morning and afternoon because they know they're going to capture the switches. In other words, what they do is they advertise like AT&T does in all these low-level outlets in the hope of somebody traversing across them. But what if outlet two was really high quality? It was magnetic. It was viral. It was, you know, what everybody was talking about. Then the market looks like this. If it's really, really high quality, if you're a high value advertiser, what you want to do is do what these guys were doing down here. You want to park yourself on the limited content site, just advertise there, don't worry about the other site, and take the consumers as they come through in the day. Because they're all going to come there, a lot of them are going to come there. You get no wasted impressions. It's great value, it bids it all up. In that situation, the limited content outlet could have higher ad prices than the full content outlet per consumer. Per consumer. What does that mean in terms of the graph of profits? As you increase the quality of outlet number two, their profits rise, the full content provider's profits fall. In the market, it might be actually higher than under imperfect tracking benchmark, if it's even relevant to compare that before, that's a side thing. Industry profits can rise, but they're only providing half the content. They're getting the same amount of total profit for half the content. In other words, the rate of return to providing content is much higher if you've got limited content compared to full content. Okay? Much higher return per reader due to positional advantage and that suggests we're going to get an evolution away from readership, capturing readership, and towards reach. Outlets that capture a, a lot of people's attention for a small amount of time. And the model is popping that out right from that. And here's where the controversy I think this is already happening. And it's already happening. And I now, from having talked to some people, half of you are going to hate this. It's happening from this. The limited content provider is Facebook. That's what they are. <laughs> They're a limited content provider. They, don't, they keep a lot of your attention, but they get people visiting throughout the day. They've got millions of US accounts. 95% of users visit once every two days. Okay? They get 10% of US site visits. They already hold 30% of all US display ads in, in the market. And most users are actually providing the content, so they're not even investing in the limited content that they have. But the point about that is this analysis is saying places like Facebook are going to have a positional advantage in the advertising market because there are advertisers there who would just exclusively advertise on Facebook and they know people are going to visit in the demographic eventually there, a, a sizable number of people. So on that ground, there's some optimism on that. Any other things you've got with Facebook are different, but at least in terms of their advertising, 
things seem to add up. All right, so in conclusion, the efficient operation of advertising markets is dependent upon consumer behavior. The combination of consumer switching and imperfect tracking can actually be consistent with the competitive effects we've seen in advertising market for news media, including the re dramatic reduction in advertising that's come from the internet, which has facilitated all that. Tracking technologies may actually assist in efficiency, but there are obviously impediments to its adoption. And in addition to deterring consumers, paywalls may cause outlets to have a positional disadvantage in advertising markets. So the incentives to provide content will move from full line provision to something like magnet but limited content provision because you can make a more straightforward offer to advertisers who have a high desirability to reach consumers. And will the internet destroy the news media? Not necessarily. <laughs> but we just have to resolve how to sort out this advertising market. The one thing I wanted to leave, leave you with on that though, let me, because um, I plugged in this thing. This is my favorite thing about our newspapers going to be um, uh, done. Let me uh, show you this. I, I pilfered this before Apple uh, deleted it from the world. Thanks for a great talk, Joshua. Um, I am in, in the, the the model that you put up. You know, the, the very classic two-sided model with um, eyeballs on one side, advertisers on the other side. I think your hypothesis is that uh, because of the possibility of multi-homing and switching costs, that the middle, the platform, becomes more competitive, and therefore they have less opportunity to extract rent from the advertisers. Um, you also, uh, I think in the conversation, talk about the, the presence of these ad markets. And it seems to me that if you introduce them as a different set of players that now sit between the advertisers and the outlets, now they, you could argue that they hold a bottleneck uh, position and that maybe they are now extracting rent that were originally uh, due to uh, going to the the outlets. So, is that a that, that's a different hypothesis, different from even the ones that well, you talk about? Remember uh, that. So, one of the reasons they've emerged is because of all this. I mean, they're now able to aggregate in the advertising market, and if they can track consumers better, they can solve or mitigate these problems. Although, we found it hard to think about how to to actually. Uh, we had enough trouble getting the model working as it was. This was our goal, actually. Okay. Our goal was, and particularly my co-author's goal, was to, to show the, the, um, that some of these ad markets were developing, ad networks were getting market power as a result of these things. But we never quite got to, you know, that was a, that's, a, that's something we've got on our list for future work. Okay. But we haven't got to it. So I think that is entirely possible, but it's kind of everything that, in this project that surprised us is, is that even building the straightforward hypothesis was a lot of actual work under the hood here, which I didn't actually uh, show you. Putting those sorts of effects, I don't have the same confidence I did two years ago that it was gonna be obvious that those things were, were capturing rents. That, that's all, it's just I don't have the confidence. Okay, I, I think that, uh, to just an observation, that the ad uh, markets, ad, ad exchanges, uh, can extract, I, I think it's entirely possible that they can extract rent independent of whether the tracking 
uh, technologies that they offer is uh, perfect or imperfect or even absent that. Just okay. the ability to occupy the, the, the space in the to, to basically be the ones to collect but remember, uh, they are money from, from the advertisers. They are competing with the ability of the outlets to do their own advertising and go straight to advertising and so it depends on that. Yeah. Um, so, R Rupert Murdoch is not among those who I would put in a list of internet business savvy individuals, right? But the daily, the daily. <laughs> I thought that there was at least one part of his quotation that you put up that might have some truth to it. That is, that maybe there's not enough advertising money in the world to make every website profitable. And so, I wonder, you know, if we looked at a range of advertisers, some that have been around since before the internet, some that have come along more recently. Um, say McDonald's, if we could get a hold of their advertising budget over the last 30 years and we look at it, I think wouldn't we find that they have more options now? They may even be spending more than they did in 1985 or something, right? But they're putting, they, while they used to focus on the top 200 newspapers, now they're putting some ads in mobile games and they're putting some ads on the Huffington Post and they're putting some ads, right? It, and so, doesn't so, that yeah. explain the graph of doom? Well, no, not, no, not quite. Well, if, the, uh, if that was the case, in order to make that work, you have to imagine that each of these outlets have some fixed the costs that they must cover in order to stay in business. So if we chop them up too small in terms of their readership, some of those outlets are going to go out of business, and that's kind of what that statement is. But that's what we then we should see. So what we should see in that situation is that there will be a shakeout. Um, and that's partly what actually people are saying is basically, well, the Huffington Post is a lean model and these other ones were bloated and stuff. And so what we're seeing is that shakeout. And you're right in the sense that um, uh, that means there's less need for uh, uh, the same amount of advertising revenue to cover those costs. But the point about this, if you have that shakeout and you're getting division amongst these smaller, less costly outlets, the total pile of advertising money should still be the same under the traditional model. So even if it was very thinly spread, it should still add up to, to what we saw before. But it's really been shattered. I mean, it's like uh, many, you know, har you know halved in a, in a case of a decade. That's just a, a very big shock to that industry. And so I don't think that model is going to explain it, as opposed to the fact that the advertisers, for some reason, don't find it as profitable to pay for the, uh, as, as, as desirable to pay for these ads, which this mechanism explains. Uh, since I'm a computer scientist, I won't comment on the economic argument, but I thought you made a great setup for a technological solution with your magnet observation. Um, yeah, I was like, why is he showing Facebook? Uh, I thought you pointed to a pretty straightforward solution, which was as soon as any large provider has a hit, where that hit can be measured in minutes because of social media and so on, why not then immediately set up an ad market for that piece of content, start charging more. This is Hal Varian in my brain. Now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm channeling Hal. I'm channeling Hal. Start charging more for that yes. hit. Right. And furthermore, um, you can have the, for your content, you can keep track for the advertisers if you've ever shown it to that particular customer. Right, right. And then on top of that, you can diversify it by uh, type of customer too. So you can, you know, for high end customers, what kind That's of That's not content a technological is. solution, though. What's an economics <laughs> <laughs> solution? You're right. Well, anyway, no, no, you're right. I, I haven't thought of that. And that's a great idea. It's a terrible yeah. answer for that. But you yeah. could, I, I, I didn't I, say Facebook the answer. Yeah. I'm just yeah, okay, anyway, saying. So. Yeah. Some of that. Is that right? Okay, right. Well, YouTube yeah. actually is. Actually, Hal said that that's what they do. But basically, when you start getting a hit, they contact the person who's provided the cat video, and they say, hey, do you want to put advertising on it? And then they put it up. But I don't know if that means they charge more for the per ad, but I guess they have an auction, so maybe it does work out that way. I don't know. Interesting. That, that was good. Yeah, thanks. This may be me, me sort of foolishly repeating Brian's question, but w w you, you have a sort of sanguine title and, and conclusion that this is good for the news business, but does that mean that you're calling Facebook the news business? Oh, yes. So, so this is my, this is gonna be my, my thing. I actually think Facebook is the largest news organization that's ever existed. 
uh, you know, so, so there was a lot of discussion um, early on in the disruption of the news industry that we had to go hyper local. What people want is really information about their very local communities, local businesses, and the newsletters, and there were some experiments with that. But actually what Facebook is, is what happened to that. Is he, so, you, so everybody laughs at Facebook. Oh, so-and-so said they've had a good coffee at some place. What do I care about that? And you don't care about some random person, but it turns out that a lot of people do care about the people they know. And so it is basically, the hyperlocal is like a hyperlocal community where people do care about, you know, whether someone had a trouble getting, because, well, my thing, whether it was the snow caused problems, um, or something like, you know, those sorts of things. They do, and they like to show the pictures of it. It's reporting. It's usually reporting of real world events. It's, it's, it's the same sort of discussions that used to take place in front, next to a water cooler at the office. It's just no one ever thought about how to put up a, an ad on people's foreheads when that happened. So I do see that as news. I just, it's just not news the way we normally define it as the professional curated things about things that are far flung. But it's news that people are talking about and they now talk about it over this environment. So from that perspective, it's a news organization. It's just, it's very, very hyper local. <laughs> And that's why people trivialize, the, uh, trivialize what that news is. But it turns out people do care. That's, that's my opinion. No, this is not. Sorry. This is just how my evolution of this is the Facebook is a news organization. It, it, it looks like a news organization to me. It just is a little bit different. <laughs> Clearly, I mean, I, I would think, you know, there's, there's a long historiography of what news is, how it comes into being. And certainly that wouldn't be part of the same story. Well, yeah, but that's been written by the people who have already made a judgment of what news is. There's a threshold of interest and stuff like that. So, so my, in my mind, I can have news that, would be, uh, that I've generated that I tell one person, and that's still news. No, I, I mean, there, there are you know, credible accounts that it, what it required, and it required this from the 17th century of seriality, periodicity, authority. Now, none of those it's got all, Yes, it's got all of those things. The authority is great. I would trust the authority of someone saying their coffee was good at Starbucks more than I'd trust some reviewer doing it. Seriality, periodicity? Uh, well, the periodicity is happening because people were sort of have uh, had norms of how, how often they put these updates in. I'm not quite sure what you mean by seriality. <laughs> uh, it's about advertisers. It's whatever is, whatever is capturing people's attention. Right, and if it's a substitute... But then presumably you would agree, maybe the traditional news media, it's not a good story. Exactly. Right, okay. But I, think, I don't think you disagree about it. No, I don't. I don't know. Know. <laughs> this is a, I mean, it exposes when you think about this issues regarding the news in, entirely, why people consume it. I, I found it very hard, and I, if anyone knows of any studies, and I've searched for why people consume the news altogether, some serious studies of it, I haven't found anything. Um, I think that's pretty important. I mean, you've got this important industry, and there's like no one knows why anyone's consuming any of this. I mean, we know it's not actually providing anything anyone useful. Who cares what Congress is doing? It doesn't matter. But now you're conventional. But, yeah, that, <laughs> No, that's true. But uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, so I, I know, I know. All right. I have a follow-up point to Paul, I think, which I think Paul's point question is, 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 is appropriate given the title of your talk. You know, the title of your talk is, can, can we save the news media? Right? And so if we wanted to, we could call anything news. We could call cat video news. We could call can I has cheeseburger news, right? And so the important part of... We, I haven't said anything well, about I'm news. Wait, I'm trying to forget my question. You're right. No, no. I, so, so I actually have a question here. Right? It's not only a comment, right? And so, so the news actually provides a public good. You know, the news provides a certain kind of sense of, of community, of sociality, of knowledge to certain kinds of consumers, right? And so can you say more about how we could protect that public good as opposed to just maintaining the advertising revenue that news had traditionally had? So... so uh, no, <laughs> I can't say any. I mean, not, not on the basis of this. You're right, I, I, I picked the title here. It's actually nothing to do with the news, but it's to do with content. And, and, and that, uh, I, I use the title to hook you all in here. I'm trying to create demand for viewing my quality or something. But, you know, that, that was, that, 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 that's exactly right. But I don't actually have anything to say about the public good part of it. 